Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my games radar vlog for April of 2023, where I'll be talking about 36 new games that I've learned about over the last month. Uh, now, I learned about a lot more than that, uh, but these are the ones I wanted to specifically highlight, and this is more than I normally do. Uh, I had a hard time culling this down. Now, I'm going to go through those in alphabetical order, and I'll try to be relatively quick considering how many of them there are. Uh, before we get into that, though, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of games radar vlogs just like this in the future, as well as get access to a ton of exclusive content, then please go to patreon.com slash Games. Some of that content includes my dozens of opinions vlogs, where I go in-depth about the things I like and don't like about all the games that I'm playing recently, and I give my updated opinion as I continue to play those games. You can also watch some of my videos early and advertisement-free, and get access to an exclusive podcast feed, where you can hear audio versions of all of the vlogs that I make, including this one, as well as those opinions episodes. Now, on that note, let's jump into these games. Again, I have 36 of them, and I'm going to be using Board Game Geek <laughs> in order to show you uh, some details about them as we discuss. Now, we're starting off big. This is 18 Royal Gorge, uh, the rails of Fremont County and the Royal Gorge Wars. That is quite a name. Uh, this is an 18xx game, and I've played a few of those. I'm generally not like the biggest fan, but the reason I'm talking about this is because it says it's a two to three hour game, which is relatively short, actually quite short for 18xx style games. It's a two to four player game, and it says it's set in Colorado. The game covers a 30 year span from roughly 1870 to 1900. The game has 11 companies, incremental capitalization, a steel mill that provides track for the companies, and a gold market that players can own shares in. Um, so that all sounds pretty interesting. And then on top of that, it says only two companies are available at the start of the game. Game. And only five companies become available in total out of the 11. Um, so that means with three and four players, some of you will be forced to play uh, the investor strategies initially. Um, so that's interesting. Overall, I mean, I, again, don't gravitate towards 18xx that much because usually they're like five plus hours long. But if I could play a two or three hour 18xx game, I'd be much more interested in trying it out. Next up, we have Age of Innovation. Now, this re-implements Terra Mystica, and there's a lot of excitement about this. A lot of people have uh, subscribed to it on BGG. Uh, this is a new version of Terra Mystica, and Terra Mystica has been done again a few times. Uh, Gaia Project is a space version of Terra Mystica with um, some uh, additional mechanics mixed in. Uh, then there is uh, Terra Nova, which just came out a few months ago, which is like a streamlined version of Terra Mystica. And now here is Age of Innovation. It's a standalone game set in the Terra Mystica universe. There's 12 factions with unique characteristics, and you're going to populate uh, the world with a hex board. Honestly, they have an image of what the game looks like, and it looks a lot like Terra Mystica. It's my understanding that the rulebook is available. I haven't read it just yet, uh, so I don't know the specific differences, but you have tracks that look a lot like temple tracks. The board looks very similar. It appears there's end of round bonuses, and then of course everybody has a player board in front of themselves with little power bowls and little power tokens that you move around that looks just like Terra Mystica. So, I'm quite curious to see what's going on with this. Is this just a, uh, a streamlined version of Terra Mystica or just an updated, like uh, Terra Mystica 2.0 with more balance and some more tweaks? Um, this board over here uh, does feel kind of like uh, what we saw in Gaia Project a bit with some of the bonuses, although there are bonuses like that in Terra Mystica. I've only played Terra Mystica a couple of times, and it's been a few years, so I'm rusty on maybe some of the differences. But either way, I'm interested. I mean, I like Terra Mystica. I like Guy Project. I like Terra Nova. I think it's a really cool uh, system, and I like uh, gameplay where you have positive player interaction, where when you build next to somebody, they get benefits. I think that's cool, although, of course, you're going to have blocking as well. So, yeah, curious to learn more about this one. After that, we have... Aldebaran Duel, uh, which says, colonize planets, research technologies, and dominate the entire planetary system. Now, the main reason I'm talking about this one is because the designer is Vladimir Suhi. Um, this is uh, one of many designs that, uh, that they've made, uh, and one of two that I'm talking about today in this vlog. Um, it's a one to two player game, but yeah, this designer, they, they make really good medium to heavyweight Euro games. Um, some I like better than others. I'd say Underwater Cities is still my favorite of their games. Uh, but looking down here, it says, um, 
in this game, you are the leader of a space fleet uh, with which you want to control as much of the newly available planets as possible. Over three epochs, you're going to discover new planets, populate them, use their mineral wealth to build spaceships, and try to gain superiority over your opponent. Um, it says it's an economic game with territory building. And down here, it looks like it has maybe some multi-use cards. It says um, as you are playing, you're going to use cards as raw materials to build your empire. But I think you also use cards to actually build out your empire. So it says you have to consider how to use use um, your cards most uh, effectively. It says, is it better to play it out as a card or pay with it uh, using it as resources? Laying out the right combination of cards will allow you to have a better and more varied options in subsequent turns. Whoever builds the best functioning civilization is going to win after three epochs. There are uh, images of what the box cover looks like, as well as some photos on BoardGameGeek of what the components look like and what the game looks like in play. It appears there's a bunch of tracks. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tracks on a board between the players. And then there's also this board with a square grid and axes on it. And that's interesting. I I'm really not sure how all this works. And then there's just piles of cards. It looks like there's a lot of uh, tableau building going on. And I'm sure this is a prototype, so the game might look different than this probably will uh, when it finally comes out. But either way, uh, this game looks neat. I I'm enjoying two-player only games. I don't play them that often, but a potentially medium weight Euro game from an established designer it says 60 to 90 minutes for one to two players. That all sounds really interesting to me. All right, next up we have Aurum. Uh, it says, play as an alchemist melding base metals into gold. Now, I want to start this out by saying uh, one of the main reasons I'm talking about it is because my friend Shreesh Bhatt is the designer of this game. I haven't actually played it, but um, I've played lots of games with Shreesh uh, and playtested uh, some of their games as well. Uh, and this one got signed by Pandasaurus Games. Uh, this is a must-not-follow trick-taking game. Uh, and it says, specifically, you are uh, thematically, like, melding metals, which is, I'm pretty sure, uh, what the original name was. Now it's called Aurum. Uh, but you are playing cards that have not been played yet into a trick. And then it says that the player who put the lowest non-gold card down gets a gold card of the same number from the supply to their collection if available. And gold cards are essentially trump. Um, you can't play a gold card if you have a color a different color in your hand that you could play into the, the trick. But if you can't play any of your other cards and you have a gold card, you can play that in there and the highest value gold card is going to win it and then you discard it. Uh, so it seems like it has a little bit of uh, hand shaping as you're probably trying to put yourself into a situation to maybe get those gold cards to win tricks. Although it also appears there is bidding. Uh, it says you get uh, points for the tricks you win, but if you hit your bid, you will double the amount of points that you get. Also, you earn points for the number of gold cards in your collection. So it seems like this game is, is all about turning various metals into gold, which makes a lot of sense from an uh, alchemist theming overall. The art looks great. Um, there's uh, images of what the cards look like uh, and what the box looks like on BGG. Uh, I'm really excited to try this one out, uh, not just because the designer is my friend. All right, next up we have Barcelona. It says, take on the role of builders in 19th century Barcelona working on the new district. So I first learned about this one because it's being published by Board and Dice. And I have a great, long uh, professional relationship with them. I make videos for most of the games that they put out. And this is not going to be an exception. I am planning on putting a sponsored video out for that. So keep everything I say here uh, with a grain of salt. Now, um, Jessica and I actually got to go to Barcelona relatively recently. And one interesting thing about the city is that it's build in the, all of these straight parallel lines, and it looks very modern, but apparently that happened in the 19th century, and it appears this game is kind of about that, which is kind of a neat uh, uh, intersection of my life experience and this uh, theme. Uh, it says, in Barcelona, you're going to take on the role of builders in 19th century Barcelona, working on new expansion to the city, uh, because the city is just getting crushed with way too many people, and they have to uh, destroy the old walls of the city to actually fit this stuff in. Uh, and it says, down here, the goal of the game is to construct buildings to accommodate all of these citizens who want to leave the old city, and in the process, who want to build streets, create tram lines, and build public services. You may even decide to explore modernism, a new architectural and art style that has been gaining popularity among the rich. So it's played over a variable number of rounds. Uh, it's interrupted with some various scoring phases. And uh, yeah, there's not a whole lot of detail of what the mechanics are. It does say work replacement, tile placement, and end game bonuses with city building. Although there is one image of uh, what looks like 
uh, a Tabletopia mod, maybe? Some sort of online implementation of the prototype. Um, and it looks like every player has a board in front of themselves. It looks very much like a modern Euro game uh, with your own board, with the icons and tokens you're probably adding to and removing. Also, there's a main board with, it looks like, some tracks and then a grid. Uh, you have a grid with lines, which I assume are streets, and there's a big diagonal line going down the middle. It looks like players are going to be putting various neutral tokens at intersections of spots. Maybe they're going to be taking control of the tiles in between these intersections and roads. I'm not really sure. It's, it's hard to glean much, but it is nice seeing an image of what the prototype looks like. And considering I'm going to be making a sponsored video for this one, I'll learn all about it, and then I'll tell you all about it when we get to that point in a few months. Next up, we have Books of Time. Funnily enough, these are adjacent to each other uh, in alphabetical order. Um, this is also coming out from Board and Dice, and I'm also going to be doing a sponsored tutorial for this one. Um, it says, this is a simple and fast-playing, innovative twist on tableau building and set collection. Uh, so down here, it says uh, that this game puts a unique and uh, exciting twist onto tableau building, allowing you to construct three great books, each with their own sets of special abilities that you can write, thereby creating incredible combinations. The story of a civilization is now truly at your fingertips. Uh, and there are some photos of the prototype, and it looks like you are actually making books, like with little binders, two ring binders uh, you can snap open and then slide pages into and then maybe turn the pages. I have no idea when you turn the pages, uh, but I'm quite intrigued. I think mechanically, you know, from a component uh, perspective, this is neat. I've never seen anything like that in a game before, and it definitely appears that that is the uh, direction that the design is leaning into. It says it's a card game with deck building, hand management, open drafting, and set collection, as well as solitaire play. One to four players, 45 to 60 minutes. It seems cool, and I'm definitely looking forward to getting my copy of this one to learn it and, uh, and give it a try. Now we have an old game. This is Bunte Runde. It comes from 2005, and it says it's more than just a children's game. And you wouldn't know it looking at the images on BGG, but it says this is a clever micro game of speculation and incentives. It's only 15 minutes long, and it's designed by Reiner Kinesia, one of the hundreds of games designed by Reiner Kinesia. Um, now, I only learned about this one because a gaming group that I'm in likes a lot of really old games, and they talked fondly about this one. So I looked into it, and it looks neat. This looks like a game I would not mind trying. Uh, it's a game of of speculation, it seems. I looked at uh, the description, and it seems there's this neutral pawn and then a big ring of various shaped pieces. Uh, I think there's six shapes and six colors, maybe? Uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, oh, here we go. Uh, this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six and six. Excellent. A lot like Quirkle. But anyway, you have this, uh, uh, you put all these pieces out in a ring, and then you move this neutral pawn one, two, or three spaces forward, and then you take the token that you land on, so the ring is getting smaller and smaller, and as soon as the last token of that shape or that color is removed from the board, you score it, and people score points based off of majorities, essentially, for that shape or color that just got removed. So if it's the last red token, you're going to score everybody's reds, or if it's the last square, you score everybody's squares. And I think that's it. I, I think there's a, a couple more wrinkles. Like, I don't think you score everything. You stop at a certain point. It seems neat. It seems incredibly light overall, but definitely something I wouldn't mind trying at some point because, um, I don't know, I, I, I've, I've enjoyed a lot of Reiner Kinesia's designs. I'm not, like, a super fan by any means, but I'm always curious to try a design of his, and uh, especially if it's going to be recommended by people whose opinions I already trust. All right, now we have a cryptic nature. Uh, back to modern games. It's a 2023 game. It says cryptozoologists travel through the world to capture cryptids. Uh, now, down below, it says in this game, you're going to deal with cryptozoology, search for strange creatures, and prove their existence. In this world, they really exist. They just perfectly hide from human eyes. Your task is not only to find these unique species of animals, but also to provide them with a safe habitat. For some creatures, various cities are ready to provide such places. And for the rest, you have to build a unique reserve. Uh, it says this is a Euro connoisseur game for two to four players uh, with a duration of 60 to 90 minutes that combines point-to-point -point movement and dice rolling elements. The winner is the player who can track down and capture the most cryptids and then present them to the public in the reserve. So it seems thematically a little bit <laughs> strange where it's like you're trying to help out the cryptids, but you're also trying to ca capture them and put them in front of the public. I'm, I'm not sure how that's all going to uh, line out. And honestly, the main reason... I'm talking about it is because there are images online. I mean, that all sounds interesting enough, um, but maybe not interesting enough to make it onto the game's radar vlog, except they have this image of the game. And you have a map of Europe, but in particular, there's this neutral board with what looks like potentially 
polyomino tiles of different colors. Uh, each player has their own board in front of them, and I just really want to learn about what this neutral board with the polyomino tiles is. Like, is that part of the proving or sussing out of the different types of cryptids? Is it like a communal type of proving thing? Or am I reading way too much into that and it's not actually that interesting? Uh, time will tell, but for the moment, I am keeping my eye on cryptid nature. Next up, we have Division, the trick-taking starting with 123, which is a funny uh, translation name. This is a Japanese trick-taking game, and not the only trick-taking game I'm talking about. I guess I've already talked about one with Arm. There's a few more, although for the most part, I'm talking about board games today. Uh, but the reason I'm talking about this one is because, man, it seems weird. It says you create large quotients to win tricks with numbers cascading over time. So in this game, uh, the deck consists only of numbers 1, 2, and 3. That's it. Uh, and then it says each player is going to start with a pair of cards in front of them that make a two-digit number. So you could put like 2-3 to make 23 or 3-1 to make 31. Uh, and then what you're going to do is as you're doing the trick play, you're going to be, I believe, playing another card and you're dividing your initial number by the card you play. So if you have 2-1 and you play a 3, then you're dividing 21 by 3 and you get 7. And the person who plays the highest uh, score after that division is going to win the trick. And then everybody, I believe, is going to take the low number of their main number. So if it's 21, you take the 1. And then you put that next to the number you just played, which was a 7. And now you have a 17 for the next round. I think that's what this description is saying, how the game works. And that just sounds so funky. I'm not even sure if that would be fun, but for the mechanics geek inside me wants to try that out because that seems like a pretty elegant little system to do a lot with a very small amount of uh, diversity with the cards, you know, just ones, twos, and threes. So that's it. That's all I know about the game. It seems like something that I would love to try. Definitely not something I'm going to like hunt down or anything though. Next up, we have Drakenhuter, which I'm sure that's not how you pronounce that. Uh, this says you hurt dragons and cast magic spells to boost their value. Now, there's not a lot about this game online, and the main reason I'm talking about it is because the artist and the designer are the same. It's Michael Menzel. Uh, Michael Menzel is the artist for tons of modern Euros. I really like uh, their, their graphic style, and right now there's an image of the box cover, which with a big baby-ish dragon, maybe, <laughs> with a funny hairdo. Uh, but there's also some images of what the game looks like. It looks like it's a card game. Um, there are spell books that you make with two decks of cards, um, which looks pretty interesting. And then you're going to be drawing these cards into your hand and playing them. And specifically, there is a description. It says, in this game, Dragon Keeper is, I guess, the translation. It says you compete against each other as magicians. You know, two stacks of cards form the magic book, as I just said. Uh, and that indicates which and how many dragons can be herded. With each card taken, this information changes uh, because of course, you're changing the page, uh, either the right or left page. And it says, luckily, you can cast spells to return your cards to the magic book to change it in your favor to score. But which of your dragons can you spare to cast spells? That's all they got right now. So it's pretty light, but mostly I'm talking about this because, again, the artist is so well-known. The publisher is Cosmos, incredibly well-known. Um, and the uh, designer uh, slash artist, obviously in this case, uh, has also uh, designed other very popular games like Legends of Andor, which I have not played, but um, I know is very popular. In fact, they've got a ton of design credits on BGG. I now realize I mostly just knew them as an artist, but uh, I guess a lot of the stuff is Legends of Andor stuff. But either way, um, this game looks neat. Uh, it, it could be too light for me. It doesn't have a time listed right now, but it's definitely something I want to keep uh, my eye on. In particular, again, this image of what the game looks like, uh, the components with that book, that seems just really neat from a component perspective, making a spell book with these pages on the left and right side, and then like tearing out the pages, I guess, in order to reveal new ones. Also, the art is just so cute. It looks like it's full of baby dragons. There's like a a baby goat dragon or something here? I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next game, and this is Engis. Uh, it says, go back 50,000 years in time and take the lead of a nomadic Neanderthal clan. Uh, so this one um, caught my attention largely, again, because of the components. There's actually a bunch of images of what this game looks like. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about how it works. So in the description, it says you're leading a nomadic Neanderthal clan, and you're going to be exploring territories, developing skills, and fighting against the elements of nature. So it says um, during each one of the eight game rounds, you're going to be skillfully using your Neanderthal pieces to explore and conquer a hexagon of territory. Uh, then you're also going to be uh, performing main actions that let you move, develop skills, and craft prehistoric objects. Also, you're going to be choosing scoring cards, and you're going to drop them onto the table to score, and you're always needing to look at the best moment 
to actually play these cards out to score. Um, so over here, it says that it has deck building, a hexagon grid, point to point management, set collection, tile placement, and a turn order auction. And uh, let's look at some of these images because again, I said there's lots of them. Um, so images like, this one uh, is really what caught my attention. All of them look interesting, but this has got um, what I assume to be a player board, or maybe this is the central board. Um, actually, it probably is the central board. I see meeples of different colors. So you have a hex grid of various tiles that you might explore out into. Yeah, it looks like in some images, not all of the tiles are out. Uh, but then also there's items over here that might uh, react in kind of technological ways. Um, there's cards with rudimentary symbols on them. I don't know. It just Something about the graphical design of this game, while it does look a little bit prototypey, still the vibe of the design of everything that I'm seeing here just jumps out to me as something that I'd quite like. And even if this isn't a prototype, if this is the final art, I'm still completely fine with that. And um, from a theme perspective, I'm always kind of intrigued by the things that happened a long, long time ago uh, for various uh, humans and uh, you know Neanderthals and, and that kind of thing. I think it's a really interesting theme uh, to explore, and it looks like there's a decent amount going on, like a lot of cards with a lot of icons. It definitely looks like a modern Euro. Uh, it's a 75 to 120 minute game, so not necessarily a light game overall. And yeah, I I'm curious to learn more about this one. It seems like something that I could like. Next up, on the opposite side of the complexity spectrum, we have Estate. This says it's a connection game with land values. It's a very simple uh, little thing. It's a 2023 release, uh, and it is an abstract game. In fact, uh, when I was going through the BGG listings, there were like at least four or five games from this designer, uh, Conrad Kato, um, all one after another. So it looks like maybe they release a bunch of designs all at the same time. Uh, I'm not familiar with this designer, but the game caught my eye. Uh, it says this is a connection game using a hexagonal grid. The board is divided into five concentric areas, each with a different value. Uh, then it says each player is going to allocate their income points to each area and place their pieces on the board as if they were buying lots. The winner is the first player to connect two opposing sides with one of their pieces. Uh, there is a uh, photo of what the game looks like in play, it appears. And they're essentially just little uh, settlers of Catan houses going down onto this grid. Um, I, I don't see any other components like money or whatnot. So it seems like maybe the money is abstracted. I'm not sure how all that works, but I don't know. Something about this is just compelling to me. And I always like to highlight usually at least one abstract game with a compelling vibe to it uh, in these games radar vlogs. So it looks like that's going to be a state. Uh, like I said, there were other ones that also looked interesting enough, but this one looked like it was the most interesting, at least visually, uh, of all of the ones that were posted by this designer. Next up, we have Evacuation, which is the second game uh, designed by Vladimir Suhi that's coming out uh, this year. Uh, this one published by Delicious Games. I didn't mention it, but the other one is not published by Delicious Games. Uh, it got signed by somebody else because I think the designer felt like the that other one, the um, Alder Baron Duel, was, was not a great match for Delicious Games uh, as far as the weight is concerned. But here for Evacuation, it is going to be with Delicious Games. It's a 60 to 150 minute game, so definitely a weighty experience. And this game looks really neat from a thematic and mechanical perspective from what I've seen so far. It says, in Evacuation, life on our planet is being burned away thanks to increasingly intense sunlight. So everyone is trying to move all of the people and factories in their territories from the old planet to a new one, and they have only four rounds to do so. So you start the game with a fully functioning economy, and over the course of the game, you have to dismantle that economy and move it to the new planet. And that's just interesting. Most Euro games, you start with not much and you build something. This one has you starting with a, just a, a lot of stuff going on, but you have to figure out how to rip it apart and put it back together again. And it says income on your old planet is going to shrink over time and production probably won't make it better until you establish yourself on the new planet to kick things into action. Resources can't be mixed across planets, though, because, of course, they are nowhere near each other. So you need to uh, take special care with your planning. It says to do this, you choose actions from a player board with the expert variant adding cards to your hand that allow you to choose additional actions and combine them. Each action has its own value, and the sum of these actions is important for an end of round bonus. Additionally, players move their markers along the orbital track based on the value of their actions. And if you raise your production of three resources to level eight and have three virtual reality machines on the new planet, you win. So I guess virtual reality is the uh, <laughs> the end goal of yes, your production and uh, is going good enough that people can invest in that now. Uh, it says otherwise players compare scores after four rounds and evacuation includes modules to add new play options. Now there is some images on BGG and I love the image of this board. Uh, it, it looks it says work in progress, but you have the two planets. You've got this orbital track going between them, and I'm not sure exactly how that relates to the mechanics, but 
it's just beautiful. Uh, the, the old planet is essentially a hex grid, and the new planet is as well, although it appears it's a little bit sparser. There's a lot more ocean. I don't know. The graphics and iconography of this one is really uh, calling out to me. It looks like it's maybe a bit of a table hog overall, but it also looks like the kind of game where if you were walking by and you saw people playing this, you would stop and be like, what is that? That looks so interesting and compelling. So I am honestly very excited to learn more about this one. It seems like it could be a game that I will very much enjoy. All right, next up we have Fairies and Magical Creatures. Uh, this is a drafting deck building area control game for the whole family. Uh, now, I'm not personally crazy interested in this one, but it seemed interesting enough to put into the game's radar because, well, first of all, the designer is Glenn Drover and the publisher is Forbidden Games and University Games. Um, that's the same, essentially, set of people who did uh, Raccoon Tycoon uh, and I think with a similar art style. Uh, they just have an image of what the box art looks like right now. And yeah, it, it's definitely a very similar style. Now, this seems to be a relatively light game. It's two to four players, 30 to 60 minutes. And down below, it says, Fairies is a mythical game where you learn about and collect fairies from five unique folk. You're going to collect fairies, plant gardens, build fairy homes, and be the first mortal to join them in the fairy realm. Uh, it says uh, when we're actually playing, you're going to select one of five actions on your turn, which is drafting a new card, playing a card from your hand, redrawing up to five cards from your discard pile, selecting and placing a polyomino tile into your fairy garden, or placing an influence token uh, onto one of the five fairy folk areas. So, that's quite a lot going on. Again, you have this deck and you're drawing and there's apparently deck building and then you also have the polyomino puzzle you're doing and it says that after you select an action, all other players will follow doing the same action. And lots of games do this and it's just a really good way to always feel like you're playing. Like downtime is not too bad usually in this kind of game because on every player's turn, you get to do something, but of course, they're probably gonna try to do an action that's better for them than it is for you. It says once all players have performed the same action, the acting player marker moves so that the next player chooses an action and you're gonna score in many different ways uh, from your cards and your area control and your tile placement in your garden. This just seems neat overall. Again, I'm not crazy excited about it, but mechanically I like the idea of mixing the deck building as well as the follow mechanic, as well as the polyominoes. It just seems like there's a lot of things that I, I do like mixed together with a theme that I don't mind, but definitely doesn't necessarily call out to me. And I don't know, this could be something that I enjoy playing. Uh, I'm going to be keeping my eye out on it. Next up, we have Fled. It says you sneak down quarters, sidestep orders, and free yourself from a Victorian prison. Now, uh, I actually learned about this game because I proofread the rulebook. Uh, so I've read the rulebook a couple of times now, uh, so I know everything about it. <laughs> uh, so actually, let's see. They don't have any images of what it looks like right now, and I'm not going to show the rulebook on screen here, but this is kind of like a domino game, uh, sort of, but it has a lot more going on. Um, in this game, there's a prison, and you're going to be building out the prison collectively, even though it's a competitive game, and you have one prisoner. And on every turn, you're going to be placing a domino-esque tile. It's a rectangular tile with two different chunks on it, and one of those sides has to match up with a side that's already placed out on the board, which is why I mentioned the domino vibe. Uh, but then you also have actions that you can play to discard other tiles from your hand in order to move your prisoner around. And the goal is to move around, match um, icons up with the tiles you're getting rid of for the spots that you're on with your uh, prisoner in order to get various items. Um, you can also trade items with the guards, uh, but also the guards can be moved by other players. And if a guard moves onto your spot when you're not supposed to be there, then you're going to be, you're going to get a ball and chain uh, stuck on your on your leg, uh, and you always allowed to be in one different spot. So it's kind of like the safe spots and the not safe spots. And the ultimate goal is to either have the most points when the game is over, or flee, like actually escape. I mean, the game is called Fled, right? <laughs> and the way you do that is by reaching the outer wall, which is like six spaces away from the center. And then you have to have the specific items to actually breach the outer wall and um, get out and, uh, and certainly get points for doing that. Um, this game is designed by Mark Swanson and published by Oddbird Games, which is the same uh, combo that did Feudum, <laughs> which is a Contentious game? Like, a lot of people have opinions about that one. Uh, the art in this game is done by Clemens Franz, who's done so many Euro games. And I don't know, it just seems neat. Again, I've read the whole rulebook, uh, and I'm also somewhat biased because I got paid to do uh, editing for that rulebook. But uh, this looks like a game that I could enjoy. Uh, I, I definitely think it's a, a an advanced kind of take on dominoes. I don't want to harp on the dominoes thing too much um, because I haven't played it, and it might not feel like that at all once I actually do. I think it's going to be a lot more about hand management with figuring out what tiles to play versus what tiles to, like, get rid of in order to get various items. Either way, that's flat. 
Now we have Fromage. It's a game where cheesemakers compete to run the most prosperous creamery in France. Uh, right now, they just have an image of the box cover, but I love it. I love this box cover. Uh, it's just beautiful with the uh, that, that line style. Uh, you have all the mountains are made of various types of cheeses. Uh, you got cows grazing on the cheese mountains. Oh, man. You know, I can't help but judge books by their cover, and I certainly can't help but judge board games by their cover as well, and I love that one. But either way, I am also talking about this because of the mechanics. Uh, it says that you are a French cheesemaker in the early 20th century, aging and selling your artisanal cheeses, and you want to become the most prestigious cheesemaker in all of France by running a highly successful creamery and crafting exceptional cheese. Now, if that's all I knew, I don't know, it might not actually make it onto the game's radar vlog, even though I love that cover, but the next paragraph really caught my attention. It says, this is a simultaneous worker placement game where players place workers to make cheese and gather resources from the quadrant of the board that's currently facing them. Once all players have placed their workers, the board rotates, which ages any cheese that was made and presents each player with a new quadrant to place workers into, and I assume that quadrant already has some workers in it because it just rotated away from where other players uh, put workers down. Uh, you're going to score points for uh, your uh, selling your cheese at four different locations and by efficiently managing and upgrading your creamery. Um, honestly, the combination of that gorgeous cover and this idea of simultaneous worker placement with a spinning, um, you know, like uh, Lazy Susan in the middle of the table almost. I mean, I'm sure it's just, you know, a little uh, a plastic piece through a circular disc on a board, but that just sounds really fascinating. I'm curious how simultaneous it is. I mean, it says simultaneous, so it's probably, you're all kind of putting things down and looking at what other people are doing and maybe moving things around. And once everybody's happy, then you spin it. I don't know. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to learning more. It seems like mechanically this could have something really interesting going on. Next up, we have Gardo. Uh, now, technically, I first learned about this game at BGGCon last year. Uh, so that was in November, but it just got posted onto Board Game Geek. Uh, and I learned about it because uh, Taylor Renner of uh, Taylor's Trick Taking Table, um, he had a copy of it. <laughs> and I kept trying to get it played the entire time we were at BGGCon, but I never did. But anyway, here it is. I still haven't played it, and I'm still super intrigued. Um, it says this is a tie lane game for two to three players where you aim to score the most points. Each player will take three actions on their turn, choosing from two possible possible actions. You either lay a tile or you place a cube. The cubes are in each player's color and they show a value corresponding to their influence, but the numbers are not known to your opponents until the game ends. And it says the tiles, which are hexagonal, uh, show various paths on them and complete loops at the end of the game will score for the players with the most influence in that area. Uh, certain incomplete areas will also score. So there is an image of the components. It's definitely not a game in play, but you can see well, the box cover kind of shows what the game in place sort of looks like. Um, you've got these cubes with various numbers on them and a, a score track and then all these these tiles. And it seems like it might be like an area control game with hexagonal tiles. Like you're trying to make fully enclosed loops and have a majority of your tokens on them maybe. But it also said that you hide the values of these cubes. I think you probably put them with the number face down and then you reveal them at the end of the game. Honestly, this might not be a game that I even enjoy that much. I'm not normally crazy about area majority games, but something about this game is just compelling to me from a components and uh, production style. I mean, it, it looks very prototypey, but I don't really mind. Um, part of it might be, so <laughs> a little bit of backstory. I used to try and design board games like back in like, 2010, 2011. And there's this game called NanoGrid that I worked on for a couple of years that looks a lot like this, like a lot, a lot like this. So I think I might be mostly uh, uh, interested in this one because of that affinity to a design that I worked on and then ultimately abandoned. Uh, it, it's it's very different overall, but either way, <laughs> uh, this is a game that I hope to have a chance to try at some point in the future, although I imagine it's going to be hard to actually make that happen. Next up, we have Humans, period. Humans. Um, now, this is not my kind of game. Uh, I almost didn't put it on here, but it seems like it could be a lot of other people's kind of game. And the designer is Travis Hill, who is a friend of mine. So, you know, I kind of can't help but feel a little bit biased there. Now, this says, in this game, you're going to blend in without your non-human traits ruining the party. And this is a acting and role-playing card game, a print-and-play card game. So, again, I don't really like role-playing at all. Actually, that's an understatement. I, I actively dislike role-playing, uh, and I, I certainly don't like acting in games. So this is not a game I want to play. But, oh man, it's such an interesting conceit, and I love the art. It says, you are not a human, but you like human things like small talk and parties. You and some of your other non-human friends decide to dress up as humans and attend a human party. However, your non-human quirks show up at the most inconvenient times, so you have to try to make your way through the party without it getting 
too out of hand. It says three to eight players are going to gamify small talk in this LARP improvisational awkward game of trying not to show your true self. You create basics of a non-human, you flip over a card to see what the small talk conversation topic is going to be, and then you start talking. This doesn't look like a game you win. This looks like just an experience, right? Uh, and again, I mentioned the art. Uh, I think the 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 cover, well, it's a print and play game, so I don't know if you could call it a cover, but whatever. I love the art style that is on the cover. And I think for people who enjoy role-playing, this could be an absolute blast. <laughs> so if you're one of those people, maybe uh, keep an eye out for it. Uh, for me, I'm never going to play this game, but I hope other people enjoy it. All right, now we have Lanakea Across Dark Space. It says you are exploring the galaxies of Lanakea in order to achieve ultimate ascension. Uh, so this is a exploration, science fiction, uh, space exploration type game with bag building, grid movement, and apparently a solitaire mode. Yeah, it's a one to four player game, 45 to 90 minutes. So not terribly long, definitely more midweight. Now it says in this game, you're gonna take on the role of a solitary celestial, exploring the galaxies of Lanakea in order to achieve ultimate ascension. Each new galaxy you discover could hold the resources you need to advance your abilities. Some may even be ideal locations for you to build new sanctums, gateways, or thrones. To aid you on your journey, you will bring life to new beings of your own creation with powerful special abilities. Um, now there's more going on here. I don't wanna read the entire description, but I just really like that concept. You know, in a lot of board games, they don't really say it, but you're essentially playing God, right? You're you're putting down tiles to create land masses. You're doing all these things. And this game is just like, yeah, you're a celestial. You're functionally a God uh, wandering through the galaxy, just doing kind of, you know, space God kind of um, uh, things like, you know, sanctums and gateways and making life because why not? Um, and that just all sounds um, intriguing to me. I, I like that from a, uh, a thematic perspective. Um, from a mechanical perspective, it seems there's a main action phase where you're going to be moving around a board, gathering resources and recruiting entity cards and doing various things. There's an upkeep phase. Uh, there's additional actions you can do with like instant actions and various other things like uh, activating gateways. I don't really know how all of this is going to work together because uh, at the moment, uh, there's just an image of the box cover and the box cover is nice. It's it's very um, glossy with like bright, vibrant fuchsias and yellows. And I don't know, I'm just a really big fan of this overall color scheme. Uh, so yeah, this could be a game that I enjoy. Um, again, it's it's relatively short for what it is uh, billing itself as, uh, 45 to 90 minutes uh, for you know being a cosmic celestial. Uh, so I'm curious to see just how abstracted all this stuff ends up being. And uh, yeah, keeping my eye out on this one, uh, just like all of the other games I'm talking about today. All right, now we have Lunar. So this is a trick-taking card game, and it says the phases of the moon and nocturnal animals meet to form powerful card tricks. Um, now, it's my understanding that this one's going to be going up on Kickstarter soon, um, like quite soon, within a couple of weeks. So the publisher is All Play, and the designer is Masato Usugi. Uh, now, down below, there's not a lot of details. It says this is a quick-playing, trick-taking game. Yeah, it says two to four players, 20 minutes. Um, and in this game, players are going to combine phases of the moon with nocturnal animals to form cards played into tricks, which are combined to determine the value within each trick. And it's my understanding that you literally build a card, um, kind of like Dois, actually, where you have a card uh, that is the suit and you have a card that's the rank and you put them together and that is going to be the card that you're playing. It seems like a lot like Dois overall. Um, but I also think that there is, yeah, it says two or four players. I'm pretty sure the four player game of this one is team based and one person puts the rank down and the other person puts down the suit. So in that case, it's probably gonna be quite different than Dois in its overall play. Uh, so yeah, I'm intrigued. I mean, uh, it's gonna have probably gorgeous artwork right now. There's just an image of the box cover. It's got this beautiful owl on there. I know I'm talking about the art of covers of games a lot, but again, I kind of can't help myself. I do I do love a good looking box cover. So yeah, I'm curious to learn more about this. This is a re-implementation of a game called Ortric, which came out just last year. And there's a little bit more description down here, but again, uh, it is essentially, as far as I can tell what I said, uh, there is a photo of what the game looks like, um, the, the original game, and yeah, it looks like there's ranks and there's uh, uh, suits going on over here. So yeah, um, I'm sure I'm gonna learn a lot more about this one when it goes up on Kickstarter soon. Next up, we have Magic Trick, which is such a great name for a trick-taking game. It's kind of amazing that it hadn't been taken until 2023. Uh, now, the designer of this one is Christopher Ray, and it says this is a trick-taking game where you can't see your cards, but you have one up your sleeve. Um, so it's kind of like a competitive trick-taking Hanabi, as far as I can tell. Um, so you're going to be dealt out these cards, and the cards themselves show their suit on the back, but not the rank. And um, you're going to have the cards in front of you with the ranks 
showing away from you so you can see everybody else's cards exactly but not your own and then you play a trick taking game so people can tell exactly what you could play but as far as you're concerned you can only tell the suit and I believe there is must follow here um, so that's all strange but then another thing that you do is at some point during the round I believe at pretty much any point you can take one of your cards and put it up your sleeve essentially remove it from your hand in fact you must do this and that is going to be your bid and it is not only bidding for the number of tricks that you think you're going to take I believe it's also bidding for the number of cards of certain suits that you take within those tricks so it's like a two axis bidding system with this single card that you are removing uh yeah it says uh each player will at some point place one card up their sleeve and the face value of it becomes the number of tricks and suits players are betting that they are going to take this just sounds really neat um and actually I've already put in an order for this one it's on uh, game crafter for a short period of time and I I, I I put in an order because it was relatively cheap and this just sounds very different from anything I've done before trying to do you know deduction in a competitive setting as you're actually doing trick taking also it just looks lovely and again overall the price point was right so uh, I'm looking forward to giving this one a shot hypothetically I'll be getting a copy soon Next up, we have Minakshi Temple. Uh, this is a three-dimensional game of constructing multi-level gates into a Hindu temple. Uh, now, this one caught my eye largely because of that three-dimensional worker placement thing. Uh, if we look down here, it says it's a three-dimensional worker placement game in which you are gradually constructing your own hapurams uh, that are breathtaking multi-level gates into a Hindu temple. Um, you're going to be taking a whole bunch of plastic deity statues, and you're securing support from five patron deities. And during your turn, you're going to be placing your meeples onto one of the available action slots and resolving the action. Uh, your choice is based on Hindu astrology. The stronger their action is, the later they're going to take their turn during the next round. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, now, I've been not showing the image, and let's do that. <laughs> Here is an image of the box cover, but also just an enormous tower, like a foot and a half, probably a high of meeples with cards stacked on top of each other. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen high. I have no idea if you're going to get that high when you're actually playing a game. Uh, there's some photographs of the prototype where it's a little bit more realistic, and it looks like there's some empty spots on these uh, temple levels. So uh, at a certain point, you put a new level down, and I guess that point is not necessarily when they are completely filled in. Um, so yeah, I'm just intrigued by that action selection system. Um, I'm such a sucker for new mechanics and games, and I've definitely seen this kind of thing at least once before. Oh, man, I cannot remember the name of the game. Uh, but there was a game that was similar to this where you were kind of locking workers in. But I think that might have been just for yourself. Uh, and this one appears like you might be doing it competitively. Either way, uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about this. Now we have Mori. Um, this is another game that's going to be going out in the same Kickstarter as Lunar that I just talked about a little bit ago. Um, and I keep saying this, but one of the reasons I'm talking about it is because the designer is my friend, Daniel Newman. Um, I've actually playtested this game a couple of times. Um, it's It's just about done, obviously, because the Kickstarter is going to be going out, and the art is absolutely stunning in this game. Right now, they have the box art, but I've also seen behind the scenes what most of the cards look like, and they're just gorgeous. You have this death and life vibe going on with skulls and flowers, and this is a trick-taking game that uses dice as well. You have cards, and you have dice. Um, you're going to be playing cards out. You're going to be drafting dice, and you can use those dice as cards. Um, there's various things that you're keeping in mind as you're playing this game. Uh, and again, I, I did some playtesting a while ago, so I'm not sure how it's ultimately going to shake out, and I'll learn soon because the Kickstarter is going to be going live uh, very soon. But overall, just another gorgeous-looking game uh, with the artist as Beth Sobel. So that makes sense. She makes really good-looking games. All right, now we have a game that I've technically known about for like four or five years, but it's my favorite things. This is a wide scale reproduction of the game I My Favorite Things, which was literally impossible to get a copy of. Uh, I remember when I went to Essenspiel and I believe it was 2018, um, I was talking with my friends Efka and Elaine and they were super excited to get this completely unheard of uh, uh, small print run Japanese trick taking game called I My Favorite Things. Apparently it sold out like that and they were able to get a copy and I played it at that uh, convention and I played it a bunch ever uh, since then uh, because a friend of mine proxied a copy. Uh, this is a trick taking game about making top 10 lists uh, where you are uh, <laughs> passing uh, things to your uh, the people around the table like, you know, what are your favorite ice creams or what are your favorite vacations or what are your favorite emojis or whatever you want. And then they're going to write these things down onto the cards and then you pass them out. This is a, an image of 
somebody's uh, proxied version. Um, you're going to write these things down onto the cards themselves, and then you're going to get this hand of cards of like that person's favorite ice creams, but you don't know the values because again, that's kind of hidden, tucked behind the card. And then you play a trick-taking game based off of what you think that person's favorite ice cream is. It's just fascinating, such a cool experience. Most of the times I've played it actually have been with a cooperative variant that my friend came up with, and it still works so well. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the reason we came up with that cooperative variant is because we wanted to play with more than four players, which is what the original game supported. Um, and now this new version is three to six players. So um, I'm really looking forward to digging into this one and getting my own copy. I definitely want to have a copy of this one. Uh, it looks like it first came out in 2015, but here we are in 2020. 23, and it's my understanding that this is going to be much easier to get a copy of. I certainly hope so. Um, there was definitely a bit of buzz when it first got announced, and uh, hopefully it's a large enough print run to accommodate the demand. Um, I imagine the demand isn't going to be crazy, but for the people who know, they're definitely going to be wanting to get a copy of this one. Next up, we have Mytikas. Uh, you play as a builder on Mount Olympus, and you try to gain the favor of the gods, which is a pretty generic theme. <laughs> there's a lot of games like that. But um, in the description, there's some things that caught my eye. It says, at the top of Mount Olympus, hidden above the clouds, lies Mytikas. Here the gods reign supreme, watching over and governing the lives of the mortals below. You are builders who wish to uncover the mystery of Olympus and draw nearer to the divine light. And the way you're going to be doing this is by building cities on the actual mountain. It says the higher you construct these cities, the more prestige you're going to gain. You'll also need to produce resources and then move them up up the levels of Mount Olympus while making sure to also keep an eye on what your opponents are doing. Um, you're going to need to gain the favor of the gods who can help you out with various tasks. There's offerings you can do. You're obviously doing um, city building up this uh, mountain. Uh, and I'm not sure how three-dimensional it's going to be. Right now they have images of the box cover and that's it. And it looks very three-dimensional on the box cover. But in uh, reality, I imagine it's probably just a flat board. But I am a sucker for city building type games and tile laying type games. It doesn't actually have any mechanics listed, but the categories say card game, city building, and mythology. Oh, and there's a follow mechanism and resource to move and worker placement. I take it back. There are mechanics listed. So I'm not sure how much tile laying you're necessarily going to be doing as you are building out the city. Um, this could be something that I ultimately am not actually that interested in, but for now, it's got enough buzzwords in there that I want to keep my eye on it to see if this turns into something that I want to play. Next up, we have Nestlings. It says, you compete for priority in a thriving ecosystem in order to best serve your nestlings. Uh, now, in this game, um, you are taking on the role of various birds, competing to gain priority in various biomes. And it's a game that has a pretty interesting thing going on with dice. So um, it's my understanding that um, in every one of the game rounds, players are going to be rolling dice uh, behind a screen. And then one at a time, you're going to reveal the dice that you rolled, and you're going to put them next to a central board. Uh, the central board itself has these various food tokens on it, and depending on how many dice you place next to an area, uh, as well as when you put those dice, you get priority for taking these tokens and then putting them onto your player board in order to feed your chicks and get victory points. Um, each player is, I believe, associated with various biomes, so sometimes you're going to pick up resources that you can't actually feed your chicks, but I think there's still reason to do that. Also, players have this wheel on their board of various different colors, and as you take these tokens off the central board, you're going to put these little sliver pie shape pieces down onto your wheel, and this is another way to score points. I believe you score it multiple times throughout the game, so the earlier you put things down, um, the more points you potentially get out of it. So overall, it just has a great um, aesthetic, uh, like a, an artistic aesthetic. Uh, I like the idea of dice worker placement, uh, especially considering you can manipulate those dice. There's resources. Um, there's a, a video online that somebody took at the Tantrum Con 2023, which explained pretty much everything I'm saying right now. So if you're curious, then definitely check that video out and see. Um, this is a 30 to 60 minute game for one to four players. So it looks like it's definitely on the lighter side of things, but it seems like it has enough stuff going on that um, it looks intriguing. Definitely not something I'm going to rush out and get for myself because of my own personal gaming tastes. But I think that uh, this could appeal to a lot of people. Next up, we have Nilo. It says, you anticipate the rise of the Nile River and manage building your buildings on safe ground. Uh, this game sounds really neat from a very tiny description. Um, there's like, the only mechanism listed is tile placement. It's a 20 to 30 minute game, so very short. Maybe shorter than I'd actually like, but either way, it says in this game, it's a tile placement in which players must direct the course of the Nile and build buildings around it, trying to sink rival buildings while raising their ships. So it says that each round, players must place one of their tiles on the table 
and then draw another one. So kind of like Carcassonne. Uh, and then it says when the last flooding river tile is completely surrounded by other tiles or when the river's rise counter uh, reaches that spot in the calendar, the river is going to overflow. The tile with the lowest value will be flooded, destroying the buildings on it and leaving the ship afloat. Um, when there are no more tiles left to draw, the player with the most buildings left standing and the most ships afloat wins. So it seems like a pretty tense, pretty combative tile laying game where you're redirecting a river and trying to have it flood other people's buildings and save your own. I don't know. Something about that is really compelling. Right now, they don't have any images of what the game looks like. Uh, I mean, they have one image here that looks like it might be part of the main game board. And then there's the uh, box cover, which looks fine overall. Um, I'm a sucker for tile laying games, especially cutthroat <laughs> tile laying games. And, you know, Generally, I like my games longer than 20 to 30 minutes, especially my Thailand games. But if it's super mean, then maybe a 30-minute game is better than like a 90-minute game as you're flooding each other's buildings. So yeah, this just seems uh, cool. I, I really want to see what the components for this one look like. All right, next up we have Nanatuck. Uh, this says, you carve a step pyramid from ice to rise high in points. I didn't mean for it, but it seems like there's a theme for this game's radar vlog of building up, <laughs> like like uh, building up towers, building up mountains. Anyway, here's another one. Um, the designer is Kane Klenko, uh, who has designed many uh, well-liked games uh, like Flatline, Fuse, Flip Ships, uh, and many others, 27 uh, design credits online. Um, I played... I think a couple of Kane Clanko's games, although not that much overall. The artist is Quan Chai Moria, and um, right now they only have a, the image of the box cover, and it looks stunning, um, which isn't surprising. I, I really like Quan Chai Moria's uh, artistic style, lots of bright colors. But anyway, it says, in this three-dimensional construction game, uh, you're going to build a step pyramid together on a mountain of ice, but this game is not cooperative, so watch your step. Uh, it says, for each pillar stone that's placed, you receive reward cards with different values that will affect your score at the end. For every four pillars built in a square, a new level of the mountain opens up with the Temple of Ice growing step by step. Who can place their stones most wisely to rise to the icy challenge? Yeah, it's really funny how many games I'm talking about right now with this kind of element. I guess either a lot of those are happening right now or it's just really drawing my attention so I happen to be focusing on that. I don't really know anything else. Uh, the publisher is Cosmos and they know how to put out a good looking game overall. So this definitely seems like something that could be in my wheelhouse. Uh, currently, they don't have a time listed. So Maybe it ends up being like a 20 to 30 minute game and I get a little bit less interested in it, but it feels like something that's going to be around 60 minutes, which is definitely uh, the amount of time I really like to see in, in games of this kind of weight. So yeah, that is Nanotech. And now we have Pins and Beetles. And I love a good pun. <laughs> and that's a great pun uh, instead of Pins and Needles. Uh, it says, entomologists compete for space in a Beetles exhibit. So down below, it says, you and your fellow players have just stepped into the exciting world of Coleptorology, the study of beetles. You travel around the world assembling your collection of specimens and present your findings to museums and magazines to become the most recognized expert in your field. Pins and Beetles is a hybrid set collection and tile placement game. Players collect beetle cards from eight families and use those to score points either with features that depend on the size of their collection or exhibits that place tiles into the museum. Once the museum is full and no more exhibits can be played, the game ends and the player with the most points wins. So it looks relatively straightforward. It does say 40 to 60 minutes, so not crazy light, but, you know, on the lighter side of things. Uh, in the mechanisms, it says rondel, set collection, and tile placement. Now, I love rondels, and I love tile placement, and I'm impartial to set collection, so th this one is definitely calling out to me uh, for two out of the three reasons. Also, again, I love a good pun, uh, and the art style is looking great. The, the box cover, just a bunch of gorgeous-looking beetles, and I'm not, like, a particular fan of beetles, like in real life, but I can definitely respect how beautiful they can be. Um, there is an image of a, a card, it looks like, and there's a bunch of icons on it. There's the, the size of the beetle, and obviously, you, you know, pins and beetles. You, you put a pin through the beetle in order to present it. Um, I, I'm just really drawn into this one for reasons that I can't necessarily uh, uh, describe fully. Uh, so I'm looking forward to learning more about this. It could be something that I like, uh, honestly, from a theme perspective alone. But again, I want to see how that rondelle and tile placement works. Now we have polka dot. Uh, it says, shed your dominoes using top dots, polka dots, and dama dots. Uh, the designer of this game is Sean Ross, and I've actually playtested this game uh, a couple of times, right when it was uh, first being designed. It was, it was designed pretty quickly. Um, this is a climbing, shedding game that uses, I believe, a single set of dominoes. Uh, uh, Sean Ross has made other climbing games using dominoes like Clackerjack, um, and I know uh, my friend Shreesh Bot uh, made uh, pins and needles. <laughs> 
<laughs> not pins and beetles, uh, which also used dominoes and a couple of sets. But this one, the challenge, I believe, was to get um, a, a shedding game in with just a set of dominoes. And it's neat. Now, one of the main quirks of this game is it sort of has a hierarchy bomb structure. Um, in these shedding games that uh, Sean Ross has put out for dominoes, you usually need to like match a suit and then have a rank. So for example, you have these dominoes and you could have like a one, three, a one, four, and a one, five, where the ones are the suit and then the rank is three, four, five, which is a run. Uh, but of course you could spin all those over and then use the, the one, five as a five, one with something else. And this one um, brings all these different types of things like having a matching run on the bottom and a set on the top or a run on the bottom and a run on the top, or just like identical sets along the top to have a hierarchy of being able to win, uh, you know, play dominoes out to, to win an overall trick. And it's a shedding game where you're just trying to get rid of all your dominoes. Um, I don't own a domino set, but um, I, I might be able to acquire a domino card deck that is essentially cards with dominoes on them. And I, I'm looking forward to that largely because I want to play this game more. I, I really enjoyed the play testing that I did of it. I haven't actually played the final, final version, although I, what I play tested I think was pretty close. And it was fun. I mean, I'm a big sucker for climbing shedding games, and uh, th there's definitely a lot to like here. Uh, and I suppose if I'm able to get that deck of cards, I could also play Pins and Needles, which I talked about in a previous Games Radar blog. Uh, definitely a neat climbing shedding game with some interesting uh, tweaks going on. All right, let's move on to another game. And it's not Super new, although it's relatively new. This is Rapa Nui. It came out in 2020. Now it says you carve, transport, and erect Moai to secure your spiritual and political prowess on Easter Island. Now this re-implements a game called Giants, which came out back in 2008, so a long time ago. And I first heard about Rapa Nui actually because the Hidden Gems uh, podcast uh, talked about Giants uh, and rather glowingly, they really like Giants and they got me pretty excited about it because the idea of Giants is you have this shared incentive worker placement system where you're putting workers down onto a uh, the Easter Island and it has a hex grid and you're trying to move these Moai statues around and you move them on your workers as well as your opponent's workers. So you have some like, shared incentive going on where you're placing these workers down to help yourself, but then you're also potentially helping other people. And I think there's some back scratching going on there. But what Giants also has is a wacky two level auction, like a, a, a two dimensional auction, simultaneous, I, I think auction, although maybe even if it goes around, it just has this highly important auction that people who love auctions really like. And I don't know, <laughs> I'm still not completely sold on auctions. I tolerate them when necessary. But then at the end of that podcast, they mentioned, um, by the way, Giants got re-implemented as Rapa Nui, but avoid it because Rapa Nui does not have that auction. And um, the Hidden Gems people felt like that probably made the game worse. They loved Giants. And for them, that is very possibly true. But for me, I was like, wait, what? I liked all, everything they were saying except for the auction. So here is a version of that game without the auction. That's probably why they made it for people like me who get scared off by that super impactful uh, auction mechanic. Um, so this is a similar game. You're going to be putting down your workers into the middle of the table. You're going to be passing the Moai statues over them in a shared incentive style, but you don't have that auction. It's, it's simplified in a lot of different ways. Maybe too much. I'm not sure, but I don't know. It just seems really compelling to me. Uh, it's a 45 minute game, so not terribly long overall, two to four players. And I don't really have any opportunities to play this right now, but it's definitely something uh, that, uh, well, you know what? I'm going to put it on my want to play list. So I remember that <laughs> when I go to uh, BGG Con or something like that. Uh, I'm definitely not against playing Giants, and I can understand why a lot of people would think that Giants is way better and Rapa Nui is just going to be a watered down version of it. But for me, Rapa Nui is the one that I really want to try. Next up, we have Sankore, the pride of Mansan Musa. Uh, it says you compete to manage the best school of a university in 14th century Timbuktu. Now, this jumped out to me um, mainly because the designer is Fabio Lopiano, the artist is Ian O'Toole, and the publisher is Osprey Games. Um, there's also a co-designer with uh, Mandela Fernandez Grandon, and I know that um, Fabiano Lopiano, Ian O'Toole, and Osprey Games, they work together to do... Um, Merv, that's right, um, a year or two ago. And ultimately, I didn't actually enjoy Merv all that much, but I could definitely see what it was getting at um, mechanically. Uh, it had some really interesting ideas, but the way it actually played just did not work with my brain. I didn't think it was a bad game. I just, I didn't enjoy it. Um, and right now, there's not a lot of information about this game on BGG. Uh, currently, there's an image of the box cover. I'm a broken record today, but ooh, what a gorgeous looking box cover. I just really like the way that looks. Uh, however, there are... Uh, 
a couple of forum posts, and one of them says any link to Merv. And in that forum post, the designer, Fabio Lopiano, weighed in with a pretty big um, description of how this game is different and similar in some ways. It's definitely not a re-implementation in any way. Um, but one of my problems with Merv is it was a game where there were several different things to focus on, and you could not focus on everything. You needed to focus hard on like one or two things and ignore the others. And generally, I just don't enjoy Euro games that, that have that as a core conceit. But the designer said that uh, this game is different. In this game, you actually do need to do everything because everything feeds into each other mechanically. And I don't know any more than that, like what those specific mechanics are, but I love that kind of game where you have sort of an ecosystem of actions and you're incentivized to kind of do everything, but it's all about optimizing and being more efficient doing those things than your opponents, as opposed to being like, well, I decided to construct buildings and you decided to trade, which are completely different mechanics, and then you won because you traded better than I built buildings. I just, I prefer to be all kind of playing the same game. A lot of people really enjoy games with highly diverse multiple paths of victory where you don't touch each path, but I like doing everything uh, each time I play a Euro game, or at least touching on everything and maybe focusing on something a little bit more. And maybe I'm reading too much into that forum post, but I'm getting excited to try this one out. Uh, it is lengthy, 150 to 180 minutes. That is... I mean, it's, it's probably honest uh, that that's definitely uh, a heavy looking game, maybe heavier than uh, necessarily what I'm looking for these days, but I'm definitely going to keep my eyes out. Um, this could be something that I enjoy. Okay, moving on, we have Setup. Uh, this is a 2023 release, and it says it's a classic Rummy-style board game, perfect for lovers of tiles and tactics. It's two to four players, 20 to 25 minutes, and the main reason I'm talking about this is the is what it looks like. <laughs> There's a bunch of images of the game in play, and you have this um, sort of square-ish grid uh, making various lines, uh, diagonal lines, and uh, orthogonal lines. And it seems like in this game you're going to have a, a hand of tiles um, that are essentially... Um, hearts, you know, like a three of diamonds, a five of hearts, that kind of thing. And you're going to be putting these tiles down, stacking them on top of each other, trying to make sets and runs with the tiles that are already out there. So it's like this communal, competitive set collection type thing. And, you know, in, in Rummy type games, I mean, there's a lot of them, a lot of variety, but generally you're making, you know, various types of sets and you can play into other people's sets. Well, here, the sets and runs and everything it's fully communal. It's not like, oh, these are mine and they're kind of scored in front of me and you can play onto it. These are just out there in the middle. And I'm not sure exactly any other details, but the image of this one uh, on the table is just very compelling. I'm not even sure if I'd enjoy it, but I just had to highlight it. Again, I, I like with these Games Radar vlogs to point out games that just have a really interesting mechanical and component aesthetic. And I feel like Setup has that going on. Next up, we have Shiju Torite. It says, what numbers will you get? What bid predictions will you choose? Uh, this is a Japanese trick-taking game, um, like so many that I've talked about before. But the reason I'm talking about this one is because it's a perfect information trick-taking game for three to four players, which is... Highly unusual, the perfect information bit anyway. It says, this game uses a single deck of cards which consists of both traditional playing cards uh, as well as goal cards. And then the deck is shuffled and placed into a face-up market. Then players are going to take turns drafting cards from this face-up market into their hand in front of them. And then once the drafting is complete, the players play a standard must-follow trick-taking game, making their goal cards as complete whenever they are achieved. So I guess you're drafting cards and drafting goal cards from that main shuffled-up deck. And it says when you draft the cards, you put them face-up up in front of you as well. So it's not even a memory game. It's literally a perfect information trick-taking game where you're drafting and they're drafting and you're looking around and you're playing and you can see everybody's cards. Um, that just seems wacky. <laughs> like, I, again, I, I feel like I'm saying this a lot. I'm not sure if I would enjoy playing this, but I'm so glad to know that it exists. And I would definitely try it if I had an opportunity. I will say this is a Japanese game and it looks like the goal cards have Japanese writing on them. So it would require paste ups and, and more work than, uh, than than normal. Definitely not a language independent game overall, but what an incredibly crazy premise. I worry about the potential of analysis paralysis as you try to crunch everything. Um, but also I'm not sure how big of a hand size you have. Maybe they keep it small enough that um, it becomes a little bit uh, easier to manage. Either way, if I have an opportunity to play this one with English on the cards, I will jump at the opportunity again, even though I might not actually end up enjoying it. I just want to play this one to see if it works. Moving on, we have The Glade. It's a 2023 release uh, designed by Richard Brees and published by R&D Games, which is um, Richard's uh, publishing house, is, I'm pretty sure. Uh, now, Richard Brees is mostly known for the key games, of which there are tons. Keyflower, Cathedral, Keyflow, Keeper, 
so many more. <laughs> and this is not a key game, but it has some really interesting things going on, at least as far as I can tell. It's a one to four player game, 30 to 60 minutes. And down below, it says it's summertime amid a forest lies the glade. Uh, what you're going to be doing is filling a personal forest board with sets of forest tiles playing from your own rack. And those tiles feature creatures, leaves, and forest fruits. And you're doing match three. You're trying to match three and on your personal tableau in order to uh, gain toadstool counters that are going to be placed into a central glade board. And then when you complete a set of four tiles, you add that toadstool to your store and you're going to claim toadstool counters from the glade uh, for your store by matching various forest tiles, I think in that central area, and you get to play toadstools uh, into enclosures in your forest to create extra actions. Um, so that's a whole bunch of words that I just said, but let's look at an image of what the game looks like in play. It's got these two layer tile holders, which are nice. But then, yeah, every player has this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine by nine size grid um, uh, board in front of them that they're playing these tiles onto. And then there's this central board, which also has a grid and then I think a score track around it, where you're going to be putting these tokens down, I think these toadstool tokens. So I guess you're doing a personal board of match three, and then you're getting rewards from that that then go onto the main board where you're vying in some way. I'm not really sure how it works, but that sounds really fascinating. This kind of two layer system where you have, you know, your own thing that you're doing that people can't mess with. And then this, this public thing where you're probably jockeying back and forth a ton. This is very much grabbing my attention. I mean, again, I like tile laying games in general. So having this two dimensional tile laying type thing going on. Um, also considering it seems like it's probably a relatively streamlined game as far as rules are concerned. Uh, that just seems super cool. Uh, for the categories, it does say deduction. I'm not sure what that means. Again, not all the rules are listed out here. So that, that that's fine. I'm just curious to see what kind of things you might be deducing. Perhaps um, it's just the, the tiles that your opponents have in their hand. But either way, this looks like a game that I would really enjoy, and I hope to have an opportunity to give it a go. All right, we've reached the 36th and final game I'm talking about today, and it is Tricky Time Crisis. Uh, it says, superheroes protecting time itself from a villain determined to destroy all time. Uh, now, I actually playtested this. I think it's very first time that it was playtested, either the first or second time. So when it was like super alpha, uh, the publisher and designer is John Barron, who I actually got to meet at the Portland Games Collective uh, convention last year. And um, when I playtested this um, a while back, I thought it seemed really neat right out of the gate. And it looks like John uh, kept working on it, and now they're going to be uh, publishing it. Uh, I think it's going to be going up on Kickstarter. They got art from Sai Beppu, uh, just really great-looking art on these cards and a great-looking cover overall. Um, so this is a must-not-follow trick-taking game. Uh, probably the most famous of this is Potato Man. Uh, it's also a must-not-follow game. Uh, but in this game, you have a really interesting wrinkle because you have the supervillain named Dr. Tricky Time who's trying to destroy the timeline, but then you also have these superheroes uh, like Kid Cuckoo, Double Take and Double Time uh, and uh, Daylight Saber and TikTok. Uh, and these are all, I believe, the suits of the cards. So again, it's a must-not-follow game. So if somebody plays a Daylight Saber card into a trick, you can't also place a Daylight Saber. You have to play something else. Um, and something that you can play is a Dr. Tricky Time card. And once all the cards are played, you're going to see which players actually played for the villain versus players who played for the heroes. And I'm not going to go into the details of the rules. I will say that the rules are are posted online in a living rules document, so you could check that out if you like. Um, but uh, if I remember from this playtest I did a long time ago, and again, I'm sure the game changed a decent amount, but um, it's all about trying to win with the villain at the right time, but then the heroes can actually kind of gang up and defeat the villain and kind of work cooperatively uh, within a single trick. It's a fully competitive game, but you have like sort of little cooperations happening overall. It just seemed very interesting from a theme to mechanics uh, tie-in perspective. And again, I'm just curious to try this one now that it's done, um, considering I saw it way back at the beginning of its development. And I've heard really good things from people who've had the opportunity to play pre-production versions of this final game. So yeah, hopefully I'll have a chance to give that a go at some point. I will admit I was not crazy about Potato Man, but I don't think it's necessarily must not follow games in general that I dislike. I just didn't like that game. So hopefully this is one that I do. All right, that is going to bring me to the end of a longer than usual Games Radar vlog. I hope you found something in there uh, that caught your eye. If you did, please comment about that down below. I'd love to hear about the games uh, that, that people resonate with when they see uh, these Radar vlogs. Also, if you think I've missed something that I really should have talked about, then please comment about that as well. Uh, there was about 900 different entries on Board Game Geek that I went through to uh, coalesce down to 36 games. A lot of those entries are not actually board games, but definitely hundreds and hundreds of board games that came down to this. Uh, if 
I'm being honest, on my first pass, I had like 70 games I was going to talk about, and I was like, that's way too many. So I had to get a little bit strict cutting out some games that I did find interesting, but maybe not interesting enough. So I cut that down essentially in half, getting to 36, and uh, here we are. So uh, I will be making another one of these in about a month where I can tell you about the new games that I don't even know about yet that I'll learn about over the next four weeks. And uh, yeah, that's going to bring this episode to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.